Welcome to the North Chapel. Those of you present here, it's so good to see all of you here. Oop, thank you. Um, and also those who are joining us remotely. Please forgive me if I fumble a bit when I go to turn on or off the remote connection. The major parts of the service are shared, but some parts are only for those present. So that's the part that I appreciate all the help I get on that. So I am Ann Marinello, a long, long time member of the North Chapel, serving as the service coordinator this morning. This month, our theme is resilience the capacity to recover and even grow from difficulties. This morning, our minister, Dr. Leanne Dunkley, will be talking with us about sacred conversations. Let's think together about how sacred conversations can support our resilience. I have just a few brief announcements before we begin. The first being, if um, you could turn off anything or silence anything that might buzz or interrupt our service. We would greatly appreciate that. If you are visiting, we would love for you to sign the guest book that's in the back on the table there by Ann Winyan. And if anyone is new here, I invite you to um, introduce yourself if you wish. <clears throat> uh, we are still in the phase of following COVID precautions, wearing masks except when lighting a candle or making an announcement. We even wear them while singing. We have not resumed coffee hour, but may have apple cider or something on the front porch after the service. I'm not sure, but the weather changed. I guess we're not, but so, I, yeah. Anyway, uh, but we will be having something that I'll tell you about here in the sanctuary with Leon after the service. So, um, child care is available. Chloe Powell is here with us. Uh, she is our spiritual education leader. And, we, and she will lead the children out of the service as we sing Go, to, Go Now in Peace in, in a little while. So, um, um, I have a few other announcements that, and there are some also in your program. Um, please consider joining us after the church service when Leon will share with us a TED Talk that he did earlier this year at Billings Farm on race relations, I believe, and he'll tell you more about that, but it'll be right here in the sanctuary. Um, all of our pledge drive letters went out this week, and we're hoping that you will all dig deep into, so what's, into what supports you in our community and give generously, and let us know as soon as possible how much you can give to support our work. Polly Forcier is uh, making wreaths, which she will be selling at the Creechy Club Friday and Saturday, the 25th and 26th. And she needs help from 12 to 2 and 2 to 4 on both days. Uh, and we'll be donating the proceeds from the sales to the North Chapel. And she's looking for help with this project, both buyers and sellers. Is that right, Polly, or do you want to add something? So if you want to help on Saturday, they could contact you. Uh, Deb Rice is handling that aspect of it. Okay. Okay. So contact Deb Rice if you're able to help. Great. And the Change the World kids, we have two of them here, plus their fearless leader. And <laughs> it's nice to see you. Um, and they're here to tell us about the Holiday Hearts program, which we're going to do again this year. And I'm thinking if the two of you come up now, you could, if you use this microphone, oh, three of you, then you can use this microphone and it'll be recorded as compared to that one, which may not be on. Um, hey everyone, we're with Change the World Kids and we're going to be talking about holiday hearts. Um, holiday time is, an absolute, is absolutely magical, but some children and families can use a hand making one part of the magic happen. This year, the Change the World Kids hope that others will help us make the, the holiday wishes of children and their parents in our area come true. 
Um, our annual Holiday Hearts effort was one of the first significant partnerships with local organizations. It started when um, Kansas, uh, see, Change the World Kids uh, visited the Upper Valley Haven. Um, the director shared a story about a child living in the shelter. She said that the first afternoon after December holiday break, the girl came out, came home to the Haven sobbing. Classmates were talking at school about their gifts after Christmas break, and one turned to this girl and said loudly, oh, you probably don't get Christmas gifts because you're homeless, right? The Change the World Kids launched Holiday Hearts program. And since the Universalist, North Universalist Chapel Society congregation has been helping every holiday season since, and our Holiday Hearts project began. We provide, um, we provide gifts during the December holiday time for all the families in the Upper Valley Haven shelter. The Upper Valley Haven lets us know the wishes and needs of each family member. We get gifts for both the parents and children and plan on getting at least six gifts for each person. It, it includes specific wishes, specific needs, general likes, favorite colors, sizes of clothing, etc. So it is very personalized and confidential for each person. Then we cut out many red construction paper hearts and personalize them with one with a need or wish. Um, we number each heart at the top. So a heart might have on it, mom, age 22, cozy, stylish fleece, favorite colors, purple and red, size medium, or girl, age five, favorite color, green, book or game about fairies, or boy, age eight months, diapers, rattle, picture books. Many times parents ask, things, ask for things to help them in the apartment um, the Upper Valley Haven is helping them to find, such as a microwave, set of pots and pans, or home toolkit. We stick a post-it note on the back of each heart with the number of the heart and space for the person who takes the heart to record their name, email, and phone. This helps us remind people who forget to bring their gifts by the deadline. This year, all the gifts must be here by Sunday, December 11th at the latest, or just try to be on time, I guess. <laughs> If you'd like to help with this project, we'll display the hearts today on a table during coffee hour on the church porch. Um, please be guided by your heart and take home a wish, a gift wish, and help make both of our hearts and someone else's be warm throughout the holidays. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the good work all the Change the World kids do, and especially for this program. We really appreciate your coming and being here, and would love to hear more about how it goes later in the year. So, Friday afternoon, I stopped by the church to check in with Leon about today's service, to begin preparation for it. This week had been a particularly difficult one. And Leon, Leon and I went outdoors and sat at one of the picnic tables to talk. When I began to share my doubts about service coordinating, his response was, maybe this was the perfect headspace to be in. Um, we don't have to always pretend that everything is fine, everything is perfect. We can share that sometimes things aren't fine at all. And that can be the beginning of a sacred conversation. Please know I wasn't coerced into doing this. He also, <laughs> he also gave me this poem to share, which is entitled Hands. And I'm not sure who wrote it, do you know? Rick Maston. Rick Maston. Rick Maston. I'll try to do it justice. I think it's called Hands. I think of my poem, poems and songs as hands. And if I don't hold them out to you, I find I won't be touched. If I keep them in my pockets, I would never get to see you, seeing me, seeing you. And though I know from experience, many of you, for a myriad of reasons, will laugh and spit and walk away unmoved. Still, to meet those of you who do reach out is well worth the risk and the pain. So here are my hands and do what you will. Thank you. 
uh, when I think of uh, sacred conversations, um, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, joys and concerns. Um, the moment in the service where we light a candle and share of our hearts and share of our lives. Um, for me, there's nothing more beautiful than watching that unfold. Um, and um, I'm forever grateful for that sharing. Uh, joys and Concerns opens the door of fellowship in a way that is genuine and real. Good morning and good Sunday. I hope that this new day finds you well. Today is Sunday, November the 12th, and the title of this morning's reflection is Sacred Conversations. It's about finding ways to connect with one another beyond our differences. Such con conversations can be moving. It's so important to do them well. In ancient Greece, they used to say, give me a place to stand and a lever long enough and I will move the world. I think that they were talking about sacred conversations. Uh, there's a passage uh, from a poet named um, Michael Hedges. Um, he's, he says, gathering circles slow too soon. We are dancing to some forgotten tune and we weave in the sky a pattern that I can trace. Fading to taste the afterglow that's as pure as the song we sing so low and our senses come down, our fences come down to meet me face to face. I think about how perilous that is sometimes, how scared I have been to look into your eyes uh, when speaking, how I have chosen uh, pictures in the back of the hall <laughs> to make eye contact with or uh, uh, railings on a chair <laughs> to address because it's scary to share of one's heart but doing so is like touching hands. Uh, touching hands is like a precious gift on Christmas Eve or each and every day. And we can stand on the corner of the world if we believe and take a wish upon the rain. And I feel a morning rising, rising up in me. And I feel some sun behind your smile, but it takes forgiveness and it takes a light when stone cold is the road and long the mile. So hold on my friends for the lifeline, okay? Those are the words. Um, uh, the melody sounds like um, <clears throat> Touching hands is like some precious gift on Christmas Eve And each and every day And we can stand on the corner of this world if we believe And make our wish upon the rain I feel the morning rising Rising up in me and I feel some sun behind your smile. But it takes forgiveness and it takes light when stone cold is the road and long the mile. And then the chorus, our part together is, hold on my friends for the lifeline. Can you try that? Hold on my friends for the lifeline. There's a moment back in college uh, that has stayed with me over the years. It happened uh, in a philosophy class called The Open Mind, uh, The Modern Mind. Uh, I can't remember the name of the professor uh, who taught the course, but I do remember that we read, or we got in trouble for not reading, the writings of Freud, Nietzsche, Marx, and Marcuse, Herbert Marcuse. Uh, our professor was uh, something of an intellectual provocateur. He had a way of surprising us or even shocking us into our own potential. It's hard to explain. His approach was often quirky and weird more than anything else, but it was always insightful. We were always powerfully invited to explore and expand into our higher selves. One day, in the beginning of class, the professor asked if we were knowledgeable about US history. And so we boasted that we were fairly knowledgeable, uh, collectively at any rate, uh, it varied student, of stu to student to student, of course. He was intrigued, so he tested us, and he asked us why we thought it was that women in the United States couldn't vote until the 1920s. Our hands shot up right away. Uh, it was such an easy question. Sexism, we said, uh, confident in our response. Nope. 
our teacher said immediately, surprising us and shocking us, challenging us in a way, we started guessing. We were in a state of quasi disbelief. Where was our teacher leading us? We guessed and we guessed until we started to get annoyed at being told repeatedly that we were wrong. When we were nearing our limit, he let us in on what he was, uh, uh, on why he was negating us. He said, women couldn't vote back then because women weren't smart enough. I wish you could have seen the eyebrows kind of. <laughs> I should, would, should have filmed that actually. <laughs> uh, we were surprised and shocked. Uh, what was our quirky teacher, what our quirky teacher said was sexist. Instantly he became a pariah in our minds. He was an awful person. Uh, he let his comment and our judgment just hang there in the air for a little while, just hang there in the silence until he explained himself. He said, I'm not saying that women in the United States weren't smart enough to vote in the 1920s. I'm saying that this is the reason that we collect collectively believed, that we collectively accepted. It was the reason that we had been taught since the beginning of the American experiment, at least rhetorically, the one in which all men are created equal. This false and commonly accepted cultural belief is built into the habits of our language so deeply that we have lived with its assumptions and with its consequences, and we have failed to address its inadequacy, and we didn't correct its errors until the victories of the suffrage movement that 72 year long battle through which women attained the right to vote. Our provocative professor wanted us to think freely and clearly, critically and independently. He wanted us to be able to laugh at ourselves and at one another, to challenge ourselves and one another without injury and without cost, without a scapegoat and, out, and without there having to be a butt of the joke someone at whose expense the rest of us could be joyful. The suffrage movement began in 1848, 13 years before the Civil War. It began at the first women's rights convention in the United States at the Seneca Falls Convention in upstate New York, just west of Lake Cayuga. That convention and the subsequent state campaigns, court battles, petitions to Congress, marches, demonstrations and protests led to the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1919 and its ratification in 1920. It read, the rights of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Women did not suddenly get smarter in 1919 and 1920, but at, at that time, we gave up our collective illusion that was limiting us. What illusions could we give up today? What habits of language, what delusions, what sustained and false beliefs hold us back from becoming what we could be in the world? In 1792, 56 years before the Seneca Falls Convention in uh, 1848, a free-thinking, critically-thinking, independently-thinking woman wrote a really good book in England. The name of the book was A Vindication of, of the Rights of Woman, and it is the cornerstone of modern feminism. It is a foundational text, even though the word feminism, or feminism, uh, as it was first coined in France, would not exist in language for almost half a century. We grow old by inches. Things change slowly. The author was a woman named Mary Wall Wollstonecraft, and she was the member of a nonconformist church with strong ties to political radicalism. You have to be careful of those people. Uh, the church uh, that she, of which she was a member was called the Newington Green Unitarian Church in North London. Uh, did you know that we were so radical as this? Uh, that we were on the cutting edge of things even way back in the day, that it was part and parcel of our faith to stand on the corner of the world and make a wish. Touching hands is like a precious gift on Christmas Eve, like each and every day, and we can stand on the corner of the world if we believe and make our wish upon the rain. 
Do you imagine how radical and how powerful can be even this humble sanctuary made holy, made blessed, made dear and deeply beloved by the best in us becoming possible, you and me, us here now? It's always been this way in this particular tradition of faith. Uh, the best in us, whatever that best is, is what makes our faith tradition real. The best in us becoming possible is the bridge that spans the treacherous chasm of the impossible. What we couldn't do before, we can do today, or we will be able to do tomorrow. It is that sacred thing within us that loves beyond belief. Years ago, I preached at our nation's capital. I preached at All Souls Church Unitarian in Washington, D.C. Uh, they boast a membership, uh, they boast membership numbers that waver between 12 and 1,300 people. Reverend uh, Bill Sinkford is serving there now. Uh, Reverend uh, Sinkford formerly was the president of the Unitarian Universalist Association from 2001 until 2009. He's a good man, and it's a good church. They're not as cool as we are. <laughs> But according to the website, and this I quote, All Souls was founded in 1821. Uh, it was founded as the first Unitarian church by some of Washington's most prominent white men, including the Secretary of State and future president, John Quincy Adams, Secretary, Secretary of War and future vice president, John C. Calhoun, architect of the Capitol, Charles Bullfinch, and the newspaper publisher, the city's alderman, and future mayor, Joseph Gales. End quote. In the words of Rob Hardy's, who was the minister at All Souls before Bill Sinkford arrived, quote, our ancestors dreamed of a special kind of church of the free spirit unfettered by dogma, a church that, of the free mind that was pursuing all truth, a church of the free person resisting all bonds of oppression for 200 years. Since 1821, All Souls has served uh, as a shelter for those dreams. I believe that Rob Hardy's words uh, fairly describe the reality and the aspirations of our faith in a general sense, however hard it is and has been for us to live out that ideal. It's hard to be t uh, bold and radical all the time. It's hard to think freely and critically. It's hard to be independent-minded. It's a pain in the neck, and it's a pain in other places as well. It's tiring, it's relentless, it can be a thankless job, and it can be unending, never finished. As the theologians say, God is still speaking. Ours is a living, a living tradition, and this is a plus, uh, believe it or not, because it means that the sacred is near to us, not far away, remote by distance or removed from us by time. It is a gift, as heavy as it is, and we need to care for the lever, and we need to position the fulcrum effectively, and we need to take care of where we stand in order to use the lever well. All Souls Church in Washington, D.C. was founded by the Secretary of State and also the Secretary of War. It was founded by a future president and by a future vice president who served together. It was founded by a slave owner and by a staunch abolitionist. Unbridled opposition is implied in all of these dynamics, and yet out of them a noble church was born. How does this happen? How is it that we can stand shoulder to shoulder with outward differences not getting in the way, even if they are differences that we cannot overcome? These days, this faith is not divided on the issue of slavery, not like it was in 1821. We are not divided with respect to voting, not like we were before the 1920s. Yet we do face divisive issues, and we do struggle and argue about things that we cannot resolve. Archimedes in ancient Greece once said, give me a place to stand and a lever long enough and I will move the world. What lever is strong enough to move us in the world today. And when we use it, how will we ground ourselves? A couple of months ago, President Biden was interviewed on 60 Minutes and to the surprise of many, uh, he declared that the COVID-19 pandemic was over. 
uh, it wasn't the wisest thing he's ever done. Even his own staffers were caught off guard. They began walking back his statement almost immediately. His statement was medically false. The pandemic is not over. It's still quite dangerous, even though we are in a different place than we were months before. Biden's statement was medically false, but it was animated by something that is socially real. We miss what we once were. We miss how we used to be how we used to casually relate to one another, incidentally relate, risklessly relate to one another on a regular basis. For some of us, the masks have also, the masks that have hidden so much of our faces for the last two years have also hidden so much of our souls. What are your feelings about this? How can I invite us into a conversation? How can I invite us into a sacred conversation about the feelings that we have on this issue of public masking? We do not all agree on what we need to do. How do we ground ourselves and enter into a conversation about all of our needs in a way where we can express ourselves lovingly, honestly, and without fear? How can we begin to develop that tissue that will allow us to be together in difficult times? It is not yet possible to know what the answers are, what these conversations may mean to us, but it is known that we will be moving forward together Moving forward requires a sacred conversation. We need to process what we are feeling with one another. Now, I'd like to ask us uh, to enter into this conversation uh, not in, in this setting, not this morning, perhaps, but in this setting. I want to ask us to reflect on how our experience has been so that we can generate that sacred con conversation right here in congregation right in the sanctuary. But today, uh, let's stand on that corner of the world, make our wish upon the rain, look around the room at these beloved faces, this our community, and let's cherish it with all of our heart. May it be so. Blessed be. And amen. <clears throat>